these are sand painting rugs. This is the, the medicine men that help treat the patients of the tribe. They have the ceremonies over different ailments and, and they make a sand painting. And that's what this is taken from one of those. It has a rainbow figure around it, and this is what they call the Father Sky and Mother Earth sand painting. You know, just the stress-free atmosphere, I think that's what it is, and just a chance to, to come out, you know, to the trading post and, you know, just have a soda and just, just relax. Everything's just too fast now. They don't have time. You know, I'm sorry that I locked my store up that I got out of because I haven't got nothing to do now. And a good friend of ours that used to be an Indian trader out on the reservation, he made the remark, he said, you know, Stuart's the only smart one of the two or three of us. He still got something to do by running that store. The American Southwest in the 21st century has unique contradictions. The method of procuring the daily necessities varies with the geography of the consumer. The Southwest has all of the merchandising hallmarks of modern American life. And in the Southwest, there are still remnants of the original mercantile enterprise that provided life's essentials to the people when these states were territories. This is another ceremonial rug here. And then this is, these are what they call two gray hill rugs. Uh, and let, let me give you an, an idea here. The design in, in the two gray hill rugs now is uh, very intricate and has a has lots of appeal to the design. In the older days, in the Two Gray Hill area, most rugs were, were on this order. They were natural color of the wool, but the design was different. This is the older type design, and through the years, they've been encouraged by the different traders to put a little more intricate designs in and still keep the traditional color. And, and another thing, they've encouraged them to be better spinners and spin the, their yarn finer than they did. The Navajo Nation, or Diné Bacaya, which means land of the people, covers portions of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah with a total area of over 27,000 square miles and 170,000 tribal members living on the reservation. 
making it the largest Native American tribe in population and area. Much of the Diné Pacaya is extremely remote and isolated with 56% of Diné or Navajo living below the poverty level. There are approximately 9,286 miles of public roads with 78% of those roads unpaved. There is also a lack of retail outlets on the reservation. Many Diné have to drive an hour or more just to get to a convenience store. It is out here that there are trading posts still being operated in the way that they began over 100 years ago. The two gray hills, there's no two alike, but it usually has the, the four cor corners starts out there, and then with the design in the center, most of them have a, a slight border. Most of the two gray hills just has a black border like this one here. Stuart Hatch learned how to run a trading post from his father, who began working in trading posts in the 19th century. His father bought this land near Fruitland, New Mexico, and opened a post, trading with the Navajos in 1916, the same year that General John J. Pershing and the U.S. Army were pursuing Pancho Villa in Mexico, and Europe was fighting World War I. Stewart was born in 1919, and he and his brother built the current establishment following the end of their military service after World War II. Over 20 years ago, Stewart bought his brother out and has been running it since. He traded out of this spot, but not right here. He had three hogans, like up there on the wall. And he had merchandise in one of them, and he had silversmiths working in the other, and he dealt mostly in jewelry, turquoise, and, and he, he had those silversmiths. He used that Mexican silver, had bags of it, them silver dollars, you know, pesos, and that's what they'd pound up and make bracelets and rings and different things. And then he'd get that and he'd go out on the reservation, he'd make a circle somewhere, either east or south or west, and he'd trade that for cattle and sheep, that the jewelry he made up. Uh, and then when he'd come back, he'd have, a, he'd have a whole herd of cattle, or herd of sheep, maybe both. They used to make a, Larger two gray hills than they do now. They, I don't know. Well, it takes so much more time to make a bigger rug, and they can probably weave two or three or four small rugs where they would be working on one large rug, and they can finish it and and put it on the market and get their money faster that way by weaving smaller smaller rugs, even though a large rug would, might be more valuable. Their arts and crafts was beautiful. Uh, the way the Indian women had about uh, weaving their rugs, uh, and uh, nobody in the world could weave a rug like a Navajo woman. You know, even an artist, he's got to have something to look at before he can paint it but not an Indian woman. She sits down to the loom and in her mind she knows what she's gonna come up with. There's no drawing there. And when she gets finished weaving that rug, it is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. With no uh, picture or anything like that, it's all in her mind. The, they was quite artists. And Stewart has worked as a carpenter and served in the U.S. Army during World War II and the only other time that Stewart did not work at a trading post was the four years that he spent at a Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school at Fort Wingate, New Mexico. Wasn't supposed to talk Navajo. Otherwise, you'd get in trouble. They'd, you'd, they'd gig you or something. And they'd, or they'd maybe give you a little extra detail or something. They caught you talking Navajo. And then one day I, 
I remember I had a friend kind of running around with around that school. And it, it was dinner time and and I waited for him and he didn't come out. And I hollered at him to hurry up in this dormitory tenant was standing right there and he heard me and so he wrote my name down and then went on went on to dinner and then when they come back they called me into an office and they had me mop the hall. Stewart's father was not Navajo, he was Paiute. His mother was Anglo. Stewart learned Navajo from a silversmith who worked for his father. He attended a public school before Fort Wingate, but felt more comfortable at a BIA school. I'd rather be with the Indian kids than I would the Anglos, for some reason or other. They're all your friends. Yeah. And then back in those days, there was a little... Now, people are all crossed up everywhere, but back then, a, a half-breed, well, they were kind of looked down on them. You've read about it, or mm -hmm. you've probably right. heard, heard of it. And, and in this public school I went to, a lot of times they'd, kids would bring that up about your part of Indian or something. And that kind of, and that, yeah. yeah. And I guess that kind of affects man a little bit. But anyway, I felt better over at Fort Wingate. In the years that I've traded with the Navajos, I, I haven't bought very many circular rugs. And I think it's pretty hard to set a loom up to weave a round rug, they call them. And I don't think that I'm, in the 50 years that I've dealt with the Navajos, I've probably had a half a dozen round rugs, that's all. And I'm sure they make, probably other places, maybe have had in a, in an area where they might have wove more round rugs, but that's all I've ever seen or had an opportunity to deal with. It's uh, just about a half a dozen. That's all I've I've ever had. The federal government practiced a rudimentary form of affirmative action for the Navajo. At the same time, Jim Crow laws that gave whites preferential treatment were common throughout the land. They'd get paid every two weeks, so they they had a little money. And and when they first, I started to tell you a while ago, when they built these day schools around different places on the all over the reservation, why that they hired uh, an Anglo couldn't work on those. They they had to use Indian labor. So that, that's the first time that some of those Navajos ever drew a check in their life. They went to work building day schools. And they were stonemasons just naturally because that's, they built things with stone. So they didn't have to be skilled, but they supervised, but they put up, you've seen some of these old day schools, yeah. beautiful rock work, you know. So a lot of them, most of them still stand. Through the years, some of the weavers have got to be better spinners, and and they they weave a rug, a tapestry rug, which is very thin, and and the reason for that is they they've spun their yarn finer, therefore they make a, a finer rug. And, they, and I've always noticed a good spinner is usually a good weaver. Kind of goes together, and, and the one that 
is not too apt in her spinning. Her rug kind of turns out the same same way. A good good spinner is a good weaver. On the reservation, it was mostly mostly livestock, uh, lambs and wool, and of course cattle, horses, and things like that. And of course, and jewelry. It was always traded jewelry. But the money, the first I knew of any kind of a payroll outside of uh, oh, Shiprock and Fort Defiance and Chinle and Tuba City and Kayanta, and they were kind of uh, kind of they had offices there, you know in those places, and the government did. Were the U.S. And government or the tribal government? No, the, there was no tribal government then. It was all U.S. government. And and the, the first hospital I, I knew was in Fort Defiance, had one, and, and Shiprock had a small hospital, and then Later, these other Crown Point over here, they got a little hospital, and Chin Lee got one. And they were just very small in Tuba City in Kayanda. Very small. Uh, the one I remember about in Tuba City, they built a new hospital there, and, and the last time I was around Tuba City, it was still there. It was a stone building, not very high, and just a pole, flat roof to it. So when was this, what time frame? You and that was back in the early 30s, when, when uh, after the, you've heard of the Big Depression. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, things is pretty tough all over the country. I mean, then, uh, that's during, right after the Depression or during it, that's when the government, President Roosevelt, said we've put schools around to, to, to where they can be educated. And before, they'd send them away to Oh, off the reservation, maybe, and and just maybe one out of a hundred might get a chance to go to school, and so they said we'll build a schools in all these communities, and that's where the trading posts like Tiznod's Pass and uh, Baclavato and. Denahot so and so on, all over the reservation. They said we'll build a school in each one of these communities, and that's where those trading posts were located, kind of in their own community. And they well, the trading post was there before the school, uh, was it not? Oh yeah, I should say so. Yeah. In Annis, Annis, Utah, down here and Red Rock and all, almost every trading post so, got a school. And this one here, this rug was come from the, the Bistai area or around Pueblo Benita. That's where this rug was made. In that area, most of the rugs were that size and and maybe larger uh, 25, 30, 40 years ago. And now they they still weave in that area, but their rugs are all small and very seldom ever see a rug of that size anymore from that area or any any place I think throughout the reservation they've 
they cut down on the size of them because they they can make them finish them off quicker, faster. Do you have um, customers that you've that you've had that you've had ever since you opened? Oh, yes, I have. But there's there's very few now that that are still alive. Most of them gone. They our whole thing has changed about three different times. You know. Uh, or more people pass away, and then maybe their maybe their family still continue to trade because they did. And I guess that's the way they do. Golly, yeah, the old ones. When I first opened up here, well, there are just very few left around that remember when I opened this place. Some of, some of them think it's been here forever, you know. And there's some that was you here yesterday, just as you left. There was a lady came in and sat in a chair. She was, had a walker. Yeah. Well, she was around when when we opened this place. And she didn't trade here. She traded at this Fruitland Trading Company. But she'd always come by here because this was the road to get up there, you know. And we got acquainted with them and known them all our lives. And and then it ended up that uh, not too long ago with her, oh, uh, maybe four years ago, she come in and one day and said she wanted to get some groceries and want to know if I would just write it down, charge it. And she said she'd always trade it up there, but it was not good anymore or something. She's dissatisfied with it. So I, I told her to go right ahead. And she bought a little stuff and then, and then now I don't think she trades anywhere except here. And, and she gets her check at the post office up there, and she never, not one time, she ever not pay her bill, brings her check down here. And she doesn't write her name, she has to thumb, thumb her check, you know. This type here is a vegetable dye. That's where they get their, their dye to the color to dye the wool with, they, they get it out of different vegetables, herbs, and different things. These are called vegetable dye rugs. They're, they're all kind of a pastel color, more, more or less the same, more or less the same color. They get the dye from different herbs. Have you had over the years a standard percentage of markup for your goods? We usually usually try to for forty percent and more or less. And sometimes it's way lower than that, and once in a while you might double on something that kind of depends. Most of the traders operated in that uh, similar. Yeah, the the price range in most of the trading posts posts were all uh, just about the same. They didn't put things way up too high because they they just kind of made it where it worked out good for everybody. Stewart has been trading since the 1920s, when some Native Americans first had to learn the economics of a paycheck. So they were paid in uh, cash or check or something, and then they would then go shop. They got a check once a month, the first of every month they'd pay them. They'd work all month, and, and the trader, whoever happened to be in that community, they had to have groceries, 
so he'd go ahead and extend credit to them on the strength of their work. Before that, it was probably on livestock or either pawn, they'd pawn their beads or something and get groceries on it, on, on that. But this time, they'd, they'd give them credit on the strength of their work that they were doing. They didn't trade like they do now. There was no money. They would come in and you had to have credit. And they would get so many groceries with the agreement that when their, uh, the lambs were born, that they would eventually sell their lambs and clear their bills. They also had the same thing with the wool. And the wool came off in the spring and the lambs in the fall. And that was two, two periods of time that they had to have credit. I don't think that ever, ever worked with money very much. It was always that they give so much credit and when they came in they would clear their bill and start over again. It was fun back then. An Indian come around the point of the hill in his wagon. He'd have three or four sheep tied in there, you know, and he'd pull up here in front of the store. And I'd go out there and get up in the wagon, you know, and pull that sheep's mouth open, check the teeth, and tell how old that sheep was and tell them how much that's worth. They'd go out and put them in the krill, come back, we'd start trading, you know, and that, that was a grand life. It was something else. They trust the person anyway, the same, as, same way as you trust them to, to give them stuff on credit, you know. But uh, I don't think there's ever any Thing like that goes on now. They know, they know how much money they get, and and most of them are conservative, and they they don't just come in here. Maybe they're maybe they say their check is five hundred dollars a month, social security or whatever it is. Well, they 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 don't come in here and just spend it all and and try to waste it or anything. They'll buy what they need now and then they'll come back later if they run out of something. And then finally the month is gone. And they settle out and take what's left. This is what they call it, T's and R's pass rug. They all always have a pretty heavy border around and the design is uh, well, it has a fascinating design, uh, more or less like a, almost like a ceremonial rug, the designs are. I, I don't know, I don't think it, they have any meaning, the design, but the rugs from that area are always on that order. You can tell a T's not Foss rug the minute you see one because the, the way it's been woven. The trading post served as the local post office for many years and mostly older folks still